go ahead and go ahead and get going. Thanks, Pablo. How's it going? Can everyone hear me? Are we good? All right, awesome. Thank you. Um, oh, wow, I'm. I don't want to be spotlighted, so I'm going to remove that because it's kind of weird to hear myself talk. Uh, let me just switch back to uh, uh, gallery view. Okay. Hi. Okay. Hi. I'm sorry if I seem a little frazzled. Um, my day job is I advise the mayor of New York City on um, rural affairs and like different outreach initiatives and stuff. And this morning, I was for the last four weeks, I've been getting up at four in the morning to welcome uh, immigrants that Greg Abbott has been sending to New York City. Uh, and I was able, actually, an interesting story today. I was uh, expediting ticketing uh, for some of these immigrant families and new American families, uh, and a lot of them, uh, quite a few of them, ended up going to Appalachia. And a lot of towns that might have, you know, might be decreasing populations. It's really interesting to see uh, that these immigrant families are choosing rural America as their home, uh, like my family did, right? Uh, so uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about myself and how we got to outrun and stuff. Uh, I've been working elections since I was 16 years old. Uh, I'm 31 now, so it's, uh, I think, 15 years. And uh, I started working with unions. I started working with steel workers. I started working in upstate New York. And the whole time that I worked in like rural democratic politics, uh, I was never told to talk about my identity. Uh, and a lot of like rural democratic organizers of color are always told to not talk about their identity uh, and to talk about you know, themselves as being an acclimated part of the community. And that's true. Um, and for the longest time, that was the playbook of rural democratic parties. It's, you know, we have to run the quote unquote moderate uh, white guy who's you know, a firefighter or a small business owner or something, but folks, the country's changing uh, and America's changing, right? And the murder of George Floyd uh, showed that our rural communities uh, can come out and will support racial justice and economic justice and all of these issues. And that we don't have to hide away from our democratic values. So, uh, you know, I've been working for a while as a, as, a, as a democratic operative. I took a job with the de Blasio administration, kind of like doing the same similar thing with like outreach and kind of just teaching them not to like get mad at farmers because farmers provide food for cities uh, and water. Um, and I uh, was an officer in the state democratic party uh, here in New York state young Democrats. I was the rural caucus chair. I represented 47 counties on the board of the New York state democratic party. Um, and that was going well. Uh, we helped elect over 85 people to local office. We recruited, we raised over $200,000 uh, for democratic candidates for Congress. We built a super majority in our state legislature because of upstate New York rural counties. Um, come 2020 and the pandemic happened, uh, we were really caught up in this idea of that we were gonna defeat Donald Trump. Uh, and nobody saw the murder of George Floyd coming. Nobody saw that, thought that that was going to happen. And to me, that was a really interesting breaking point because by that point, I've, I've been supporting all sorts of different democratic candidates. I really didn't care you know, if you held the quote unquote progressive values or something, I was just helping uh, to make sure there were rural communities who were represented in Congress and in our state legislature. Uh, when George Floyd was murdered, uh, we had Democratic candidates that would, uh, instead of condemn the murder, Democratic candidates that we had fundraised for, uh, supported, endorsed, not in the reddest districts in our state, uh, refused to condemn the murder of George Floyd. We had Democratic candidates say things like Black Lives Matter needed to be unnecessary. Um, I myself was attacked uh, as a person of color uh, for bringing this up. Uh, we had, I can tell you of one town supervisor who in the midst of Black Lives Matter protests uh, in Ithaca, New York, one of the few towns that has a black mayor in the Northeast, uh, wanted to talk about 5G conspiracy theories and center that instead of conversation about black lives. And we noticed that and this is like something that I, I like to talk about a lot, you know, because people are talking about, you know, you just got to vote Democrat to make sure that women's rights and things are, are protected. That works really well when we have competent Democratic parties, but across rural America, we do not have competent Democratic parties. We have Democratic parties that are unwilling to have conversations about racism, sexism, homophobia, and are willing to make sure that the kind of candidates that we need to run now that are diverse candidates, that are women, that are people of color, are checked at the door and made sure that they cannot run for office. Mm -hmm. So our organization was started um, because of that. I quit the state Democratic Party um, and a bunch of my friends who had gotten elected to local office said, you know, there's not as much momentum as there was in the passing of state New York. And I connected with a large group of uh, rural Democratic organizers across the country. And we noticed that this was an issue nationwide, uh, that we were seeing Democratic candidates 
usually who were, you know, not your traditional Democratic candidate in a rural area, but not, not a white candidate, being told that they can't run for office, that they don't have the experience. Uh, one of our panelists at one point was told that they have to cut their hair because uh, as a person of color, their hair did not match the district they were running in, uh, stuff like that. And so we started out to make sure we could circumvent that because our communities are changing. Uh, and way too often, uh, we're told that, you know, you have to be a certain way to run in a rural community. Well, we've got 136 uh, ways to show you that you can be yourself and you can run and you can actually be a diverse candidate uh, and win. We've recruited over 200 candidates for local office. We've built uh, coalitions across 11 states uh, and hopefully 12 soon with North Carolina. Uh, and uh, we've won office. And we've won in places that Donald Trump has won by double, even triple digits, right? Um, a good example of that is uh, one of our board members in East Texas, uh, Hunter Evans, who's a, a Red River County Democratic chair. Last April in the local elections there, we helped elect eight Democrats to uh, town councils. Two of them sat in, in, count, in towns that voted over 90% for Trump. And these are folks that are Democratic and they ran as themselves and they ran as being whom they are. Um, and actually, if you guys could give me a second, because I just want to make sure if my panelists are in here. I see some folks, uh, somebody who had been a part of our outrun uh, coalition conversation in Ontario County and upstate New York. And I have Ian here, um, who's from North Carolina. And uh, we've been uh, kind of parlaying back and forth. But anyways, Outrun is here to make sure, uh, the name of the group is um, the Outrun Coalition. Outrun is here to make sure that we can bring conversations about bringing diversity uh, and injecting a new dynamic into candidate recruitment across our rural communities. Uh, we build templates. We make sure that we have a panel of local elected officials that are not your quote unquote traditional democratic elected officials, which most of the time means that they're black, brown, uh, BIPOC, uh, women, LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus, um, young people, working class people, who are oftentimes not asked to run for office. Uh, and we show the mostly kind of, and let, I'm gonna be honest here, the mostly white democratic establishment within rural county, rural democratic parties, that you don't have to be like your quote unquote traditional candidate to win elections. Um, and we've won. Uh, and we've elected several members to state legislatures. We've elected the first woman of color to the Vermont State Senate. Uh, a lot of our panels have been uh, Democrats who were elected in upstate New York. Um, the mayor of Talladega, Alabama has been a part of our organization uh, for quite a while now. He was the first African-American mayor of that town. If you know enough about NASCAR, that's like NASCAR city. Uh, that's where actually Let's Go Brandon was invented. And the place that where Let's Go Brandon was invented has a Democratic Black mayor who won by 30 votes because we were able to make sure that there was a coalition in place to help him uh, overcome the traditional boundaries that can't, the non-traditional candidates have. Um, and I'm sorry, I uh, usually am more prepared. I asked my, um, oh, Giancarlo's here. Uh, so, sorry, I don't, I'm not really good at transitions, folks. I apologize. Um, I'm just gonna uh, make sure that we move over to our, our pan one of our panelists here. And uh, that's Dutchess County Legislator, uh, Giancarlo Uvarius. I know you're here. If you could uh, please speak. Hi, everyone. Giancarlo? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay, hi. Yeah, okay, take it away. All right. Uh, so uh, like, like Paolo mentioned, uh, my name is Giancarlo Uvarius. I am uh, the Dutchess County Legislature uh, in a place called Kipsy, New York, uh, was elected uh, in 2016, took office in 2017. And uh, but before, I, before I get started, uh, I cuss a lot, not because I lack vocabulary, just because I'm passionate about the shit that I'm talking about, okay? So if you guys are okay with that, amen, Lord is working on me, okay? So uh, I got involved in, in politics, really, I was never involved before. So I wasn't somebody who actively voted in, in all elections. Uh, I, really didn't give a shit uh, about like any type of elections, right? Uh, I cared about beer and football and that was pretty much it. Uh, until I, I came back home to Poughkeepsie, uh, you know, after college and really started seeing a, a lot of my friends die. Uh, so where I grew up, we're a really small area, about five miles long. And in the 10 families that were in my block, there's only two of us left. Uh, myself and the neighbor that lived behind me, all of us have died. Uh, my graduating class, uh, of high school in 2009, uh, where we started with 350 graduates. 
our 10 year uh, anniversary came in 2019, we were at 212. The rest of them were either in jail or passed away because of overdose. Uh, and so, and seeing all the violence as well that has taken place uh, in my area, again, I mentioned we're five miles long. We don't have a trade school. Uh, we don't have like a youth center. We don't have like a boys and girls club or a YMCA uh, that you all may be familiar with. So we don't have any of that. Uh, and so there was a lot of violence happening uh, in the past year, in the past two years, I would say. The at least 65% of the shootings that have taken place in my area have been by kids younger than the age of 14. So a lot of the, the deaths that have been happening have been children. They're, they're not 30 year old people, you know, 20 year old people. These are teenagers, these are babies. Right now, some of you have kids that are 14. Some of you have grandkids who may be just, just turning into teenagers. Those are the kids that are dying in my area. Uh, and so uh, in, the, in the summer of 2011, uh, my dad is a pastor. Uh, in that summer, we were hosting uh, three funerals a week, every week, for those three months in 2011, and all of them were friends of mine. So from 2011 to present day 2022, I've lost over 60 of my friends to drugs and violence. Uh, and so seeing all of that happening, and then not, not seeing any elected official, or, or anybody for, for that matter, really giving a shit uh, about what's happening, Right. Uh, and so I got involved with a former uh, state senator and, and I said, hey, man, I, I just really I want to know why, why the fuck my friends are dying and you white folks ain't doing shit about it. So I need to know what's happening so I can stick a fork in it. And, and I pretty much laid it out that way. Um, and so I took him to uh, in, in part, I took him to one of the dangerous areas of my of my area. And he saw 11 year olds drug dealing, 12 year olds prostituting. Right. He saw all of that. And the reason why nobody knew about it was because these elected officials were not from my area. They didn't go to the same schools I did, uh, did not have the same barriers to entry to politics like I did. And if they knew about it, they didn't care about it as much because black and brown folks don't vote. That was pretty much the gist. Uh, and so after that, uh, I decided to get involved in politics. Uh, for the county legislature or, or the board of legislatures for some few. Uh, and that came with a lot of resistance. One, because I'm brown, uh, I have long hair, I have tattoos. Uh, and so one of the things that my state party wanted me to do was to cut my hair. Uh, and I'll, I'll never forget it. They said, well, John Carlo, I'm, we're happy that you're running, but it would be better if you had more of a gentleman's cut. I was like, what the fuck does that mean? A gentleman's cut. You know how many ugly people there are in this world with short hair and call themselves gentlemen? Come on now. Come on now. At least let me rock pretty with this long hair. And that was the first time that I really understood what that barrier was. It was like a lot of us, and, and I'm a Democrat, uh, a lot of us uh, hold each other back. And I, I made it a, a point to them, to the state party, that, well, I'd rather lose looking like who I'm trying to represent than to change and sell out and when, and then my community no longer knows who I am. And so I really ran on that. Well, number one, being a local kid from the area. I know you, you know me. You and your kids, we played football together. You see me at the grocery store, right? Uh, you see me walking my dog, you see me with my son, right? And so having that relationship and knowing that I came from uh, the same mud as we say up here in upstate New York, I came from the same mud as you. I know what you're going through, especially when it came to black and brown issues that weren't being talked about in my area because there was no one who was black or brown in the area being represented. Uh, and that's how, really, that's how I ran. And that's how I won. I didn't wear a suit and tie every day. I wore sneakers, I wore shorts, I wore a regular shirt. And it just so happens like, hey, my name is John Carlo. I'm, I'm, from, I'm your neighbor, I'm from here. I want to make white people uncomfortable. How about you vote for me? Right. And so that was kind of, of the tagline is, hey, I want to make white folks uncomfortable. Right. Number two, I'm calling myself the prettiest legislator in Dutchess County because there's a lot of ugly in the world and I'm trying to make it nice. And so that's exactly what we did. Uh, and for, I was the first time candidate running, uh, won by over about 50% of the vote, became the first Afro Latino in the seat. And since its founding of the Dutchess County Legislature, 
And I've been making white folks uncomfortable since. And it's been very, very fun uh, alongside the Outrun Coalition where we get to show people that you can win. You can win. You don't need a lot of money to win. What you do need to find out is your win number, number one, find out how much you need to win and then hit the pavement running. Uh, in my in my experience, when it came, oh, you need eight thousand dollars to run or ten thousand dollars to run. I've never raised more than three hundred bucks, and I've been in office for almost six, seven years now. It's not about money. It's not about money. It's about relationship. How many doors are you knocking? How many people are seeing you, visibly seeing you, and say, "Hey, I know that guy. Well, I know this lady. Well, I know this person. This individual." That's all you need. That's all you need. So if you're passionate about what you want to do, you're passionate about running, you're passionate of being more diverse, which we need, especially women of color, LGBTQ, disabled, we need more of you in this. And we can win. We can win. We can truly, truly win. Uh, you know, the Outrun Coalition in Palo has proved it all over rural America, especially in areas that Trump have won. Democrats have won. Young people have won. LGBTQIA have won. Our, our outrun coalition is filled with those people, right? This historically excluded people who have whooped the shit out of Republicans. Yeah, I kicked ass. <laughs> literally, literally whooped the shit out of Republicans. And then they cry in the places where Trump has won on a national level. Young rural people have won. And so I, I encourage you to to one, to say like, this is absolutely fucking possible. All right, we can whoop ass, take names and do all the great things. We can do all that. It does take work. I won't lie to you. It's work, but it can be done. We can win. We can absolutely win all across the board. Uh, so with, with that being said, I, I leave you and I, and I thank you for your time. Uh, I'll say my 14 Hail Marys after this call. All right, just to make sure I get all the cussing out, right? So thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Giancarlo. Let me just say this too. Giancarlo's the only Democrat sitting in his town at any elected level, uh, except for Congress, which like we can talk about later. Um, so uh, the next person I want to bring up is my really good friend, uh, hopefully one of the next state senators from the Hudson River Valley. And if you all have heard about the special election that happened a few weeks ago, the Hudson River Valley kind of shocked the world. We uh, ended up defeating a Republican for Congress uh, in a place where people were telling us not to uh, talk about social rights, uh, women's rights, LGBTQ rights. And I think Eric really embodies that energy. Eric represents an 82% Republican village. Uh, Eric, if you don't mind. Are you there? Uh-oh. Oh man, I think he got kicked out. Oh no, I don't see him. He was in here. I'm looking for him, Paolo. I don't see him among the participants. Um, if he he was he, in here yeah he may try to pop back in i don't know what happened so well do you, yeah. can you maybe characterize a little bit about uh about that race and then um hopefully he's able to pop back in but if not we'll we'll wrap up and maybe he can join us during the q a yeah and i also wanted to show a template for like a quick second if that's okay the thing that i shared you on sure let yeah. me uh, you want me to yeah. share my screen now with it uh, no, let's just, I'll talk about Eric's race and then we'll talk okay, about- Okay, and uh, then I'll do that. Okay. You just me tell me Eric, yeah, Me and Eric connected uh, back when I was a rural caucus chair. Um, Eric had never run for office before, but it, you know, in Delaware County is a very Republican county in upstate New York. Uh, not everywhere is New York City. A lot of people think that upstate New York can be uh, somewhat liberal. It's not. Um, and Eric, you know, we just, he said he wanted to run for village trustee and, uh, I provided him with about 400, uh, 400 phone calls and uh, he ousted a 15 year incumbent uh, as an openly gay uh, village candidate, village trustee candidate. In the second election, he was unopposed uh, because the Republicans couldn't find someone to run against him. He was so popular. He got the most votes out of all the uh, candidates uh, for his village board. Uh, and then what happened was uh, Democrats were doing redistricting uh, and we got into a tussle. Redistricting got caught up in court. Uh, all in all, it turned out that Eric uh, ended up running for state Senate. Uh, and Eric has a really good chance of winning because he's got a three-way race with a Republican and a Republican that lost the primary and is contesting it through another ballot uh, in a district that Trump won by 10 points. Um, and once Eric gets elected, 
you'll be the first openly LGBTQ elected um, state senator, state legislator from upstate New York, uh, which is making strides. Um, and so we really want to show, first of all, stress two things, right? Our trainings are free. Uh, we provide them to county Democratic Party and rural progressive organizations. We have an open mind for everyone. Uh, it takes us two weeks to set up. And then like, Anthony, do you mind sharing the thing now? If sure. that's okay. Thank yeah, you. It'll take me a moment, but I will do it. Thank you. I'm sorry, y'all. No, 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 sweat. no sweat. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, y'all. I've been, uh, it's been really uh, kind of a long time. So this is one of our templates, right? It's kind of like a where, why, how, and who of how to uh, take over uh, counties and what to target, right? And what we do is we do a couple of things. We develop win numbers for town and local offices. These are two count counties in Virginia, Prince Edward and Buckingham counties uh, that hosted one of our outrun trainings. Uh, we talk about the why. A lot of people kind of give up hope on rural American and rural towns and small town elections. Y'all, some of these towns, they're only maybe like 50 votes apart in terms of election margins. And that's 50 votes, 50 people you can get out and vote. Um, and why we want to be able to make sure we kind of build that uh, coalition out there. Because we believe that no matter what you do in the future and in the past, when you're a rural Democrat, you have to outrun the top of the ticket. The how, right? Um, We've been talking about, you know, how to run for office, like why you should run for office and like how to run for office as a non-traditional candidate. But the how's really important, right? And we can't just keep talking about uh, doing the same old thing. We need to know what a win number is. We need to know how to use ban. And we need to make sure that you have a young person that's willing to work with you to get the experience to use van so that when the next person runs for Congress in your area, there's a, already a, a, an organizer they can pay in that community, right? And finally, the who, and this is the most important part, right? Um, while we talk about diverse candidates running for a local office, candidates can come from all sorts of different streams and they can be connected to the county Democratic Party, right? But we can't rely on that political class existing in our counties because what has happened? National political realignment. So a lot of those folks have ended up gone to the Republican side just to make it seem like they can do something to their communities, right? Or that's where the power is, right? We have to change our mindset and have an open mind uh, to make sure that we recruit folks whose experience may not be electoral, uh, but they can learn and build experience through shaking hands, right? A barber knows more people in a town than an accountant. Uh, a grocery store clerk has shaken more hands and done more favors for people, working people in that community than somebody who's a lawyer, right? We don't need people who sign corporate expense accounts running for town council. We need the kid who works at the loading dock at Home Depot. Right, and that's the coalition of the 21st century, right? It's making sure that we can build that working class coalition, but also ensuring our social values by having the people who have had to overcome adversity to get accepted in our communities uh, running for office. And I'll give you an example, right? I, I was almost recruited twice by the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee to run for my home district in um, New York 23rd. Why? Um, people can't pronounce my name back home, but they call me Paul. Why? Because they love me. And in that in itself shows that there's an act of love there for people. And also my dad like rep has like the largest train manufacturing base in uh, Western New York. And I think it says a lot about immigrants bringing jobs to rural communities, but I digress. Candidates who have overcome adversity are able to win elections because it is easier for them to connect with voters because they have always had to have difficult conversations. Uh, and it may not seem like this in many parts of the country, Republicans are ahead of us at doing this. If you look at Oklahoma, what was the runoff? Oh yeah, sorry, that says upstate New York, I apologize. Um, what was the runoff in Oklahoma? It was two indigenous candidates running uh, and they're gonna be running against a white woman who's the Democrat. What is going on across the South where more black and brown Republicans are being elected to office? Well, we have to fight in the party to actually even get Latinos to be able to be on the ticket. We have to change our mindset. We have to make sure that we change uh, the way that we like think um, and, you know, Finally, the thing that I would say is like experience is like the big thing that people like to talk about. People don't have experience to run for office. Folks, experience is something we learn. It shouldn't be a barrier to stop uh, folks from participating. And we're here to make sure you have that. And these are the links that we uh, provide and we can provide more resources as well to make sure that you are connected to the national resources that these national organizations say they will provide like run for something and stuff, but they just don't have the infrastructure to go out and talk to rural counties like we do. Uh, and so finally, we're the Outrun Coalition. Um, that's kind of like an abbreviated version of our presentations. Usually they're like an hour and a half. And I know that we are running short on time. So go ahead, Anthony. 
Okay, Paolo, great. So um, I'm gonna look through the chat box to see, th thank you to Paolo and Giancarlo both. I'm gonna look through the chat to see if we have questions, but in the meantime, folks can do one of two things. You can use the icon to raise your hand and, and or you can just come off mute and ask your question. We'll start with Erica. She's got her hand up and let me just make a question. Um, Anthony, this is, yeah. a safe, this is a safe space for everyone. And so if you have some questions about diversity or, or feel like you have some questions about making sure that like, you know, you don't want to be, come off as offensive to someone or something, please ask them because we're here to make sure that you are equipped to make sure that you win in the fall. Sorry, that's it. Go ahead. Yeah. Great, thank you both so much for the presentation. Um, question for Giancarlo, because you mentioned you had done a lot of door-to-door -door talking to folks in your area, and I'm wondering what you were hearing, you know, from people about like what was what were their burning issues, and then and how did you take that and sort of like translate that into what your platform was for your campaign? So my my platform for my campaign was uh, getting a, a youth center uh, in my area, getting a trade school in my area and then better police relations. Uh, so when I was knocking on doors, I would say, hey, my name is uh, John Carlo. And, and usually a lot of people in my area uh, are, are parents or their grandparents. And I was like, I I'm running because it really sucks that your grandkids have nowhere to go. Oh, damn, shit, it sucks that your kids have nowhere to go after school. And I, I formulated the conversation before they even asked me, right? So I was like, and so that's really how I did it. And a, a majority of people the average person doesn't really give a shit about what's happening in Washington. What they really want is to be able to make sure that they kid, their kids go to a good school. If they want to put them in programming, that programming is available for them to go to. And that's really the really what I, I centered it around. I didn't really talk about national politics. I talked about this is what we don't have. This is what I see we need in order for you to stay here. right? Because uh, a lot of people from my area once they graduate high school, they're gone. They don't come back. And so what I wanted to do was to make sure that if you went to high school here, if you went to college here, there's a reason for you to come back. There's a reason for families to stay here in this area. And that was me, and that was me uh, giving the conversation, right? And then they were like, yeah, damn, you know what? You know what, there isn't a, there isn't a, soccer, a soccer program here. Um, in the area that, that there is a uh, youth programming, it's about 30, 40 minutes away from where we are. And so there's lack of transportation. There isn't a bus route that goes to that youth program, right? So it uh, alienates a, a lot of black and brown people, a lot of elderly people who may wanna do uh, swim aerobics and can't do that, right? So I uh, commanded uh, the conversation so that I got the responses. Um, uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Erica, you can help me see if anybody pops their hand up that I'm not seeing. But um, here's one from Beth who has asked, she says she's done the type of canvassing that you're talking about, Giancarlo. Uh, she says, how do you talk with folks who are set on one issue, usually guns? Hmm. Uh, uh, do you mind, do you wanna go or do you wanna? Uh, so, so I'll say first that- uh, Yeah, you, you guys you guys can both answer. I, I, I believe in the second amendment. Uh, I'm someone who's in, in the process of getting his pistol permit. Um, my wife is as well. I, I believe in guns. I, I believe it's a great equalizer. Uh, especially with my wife. And uh, during my campaign trails over the years, I've gotten death threats and people who uh, broken a window, tried to harass my wife, right? So f for me, uh, in that aspect, legal responsible ownership is perfect. Do I believe that people need AR-15s all over the place? No, no. If you're a good shot, you're a good shot. You're not going to need that. Uh, but if someone is solely focused on something that would never even pass on to my desk, it's not something that I answer. I just say, you know what, that is something for the national committee to handle. I am a local candidate. These are the issues that I think are going to hit you in the next two weeks, rather than whatever uh, national politic you're working on. Um, so let me just say this is, uh, uh, I've been a, I, I was a car carrying NRA member for a while. I got my concealed carry back home because I was threatened by neo-Nazis. Uh, for the work that I was doing and stuff. Um, I think that when we frame the conversation about the Second Amendment and gun control and stuff in the context of local elections, we end up getting burned because that's what Republicans want us to do. And that's how we turn out Republican voters. When we come up and talk about, you know, 
Republican voters and the things that they want to talk about. I think that in the universe of voters that we want to talk to, sure, we're going to get one or two people that are going to be uh, somebody that is going to like want to talk about guns for 15 minutes. For every person that's like that, I can guarantee you that there are 10 people that we can register to vote to come out and vote for the first time. And you can talk to both and you can convince one and get out the other to vote because usually they're neighbors and you can get them to start talking to each other. And that's what I would recommend in that context. As for gun control, I mean, I am going to be completely honest. I think an assault weapons ban is just a smorgasbord of words. Um, I don't believe in AR-15 control. I think that a lot of the conversation about gun control in the last 20 years has been dominated by people who think that talking about quote unquote assault weapons is going to change anything. And has it? No. And until we abandon that conversation, we are not going to be able to move forward as a part of your country. I'm ranting, I'm sorry, but like, let's be real here. If Michael Bloomberg is gonna spend money in like rural America to talk about you know assault weapons or something, it's not gonna work. The best way to make sure we move forward in this conversation is show that we show, is show that like, we can not only talk about diversity of representation, but also diversity of thought and nuance on gun control. And that's, uh, that's my thing, sorry. That's okay, that's okay. I yeah. think the question was maybe, she brought up guns as an example, but was more about what do you do when somebody has a single issue focus? Uh, yeah. And, and I think Giancarlo kind of answered that by saying, you know, if, it, if it's not relevant to the office yeah. you're seeking or you're in, you know, then you just let it go. Let me go to another one here. This is a, a challenging question from Edward. He says, electing for the sake of representation of identities and not focused or not to accomplish practical change may not be sustainable in rural areas where working folks don't care so much about representation, but care a lot about practical results. Yeah. Should a candidate be seeking to represent identities or rather to represent practical change that rural voters want? Maybe both of you could respond to that. Um, do you mind if I go first, Giancarlo, or do you wanna go? Okay, um, so I think it, uh, someone's identity is a part of their candidacy. And if we're going to actually talk about their ability to run for office, then we cannot make them hide their identity because there's no practicality in making a candidate hide who they are for the sake of like accomplishing results because something that exists in our rural communities is that gay people have existed in these communities immigrants have existed in these communities black and brown people exist in these communities and these people are known in their communities for not just being you know one part of their identity but like i'll give you an example right um uh sheriff in rural ohio uh how did he get elected he was cardiologist for most of people's grandparents and he's an arab american and if we talk about like identity most rural counties across the country, actually all rural counties in the, across the country are becoming much more diverse. Why? Because the younger, younger white folks are leaving. And who's left? People of color and people who cannot make the change right away. And so like, if we're going to talk about um, making sure that like, we represent people and, and talk about for the sake of representation, I, I don't know how we can get candidates to run for local office and win when we're telling them to run as something that they're not. So if you're gay and you want to run for town council, run as like being the town councilman. But here's what you got to do. You got to say, yeah, sure, I'm gay, but I'm going to plow the roads. I'm going to cut your taxes. I'm going to make sure that you can get home Thanksgiving without the power being out. And that's what matters more than anything. And that's how you defeat the culture war. Because waiting to sit there and like trying to police what a candidate says is not helpful. But go ahead, Giancarlo. I wish I had something to add. I think Carlo said it beautifully. Uh, really is like you can be black and still have answers. You can be brown and still have answers. You can be gay and still have answers. It, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's it, it's not hard. Local politics isn't difficult. We make it difficult, as in as in us as Demo people, Democrats. Yeah. We make it yeah. fucking difficult for everybody else to run. It's really yeah. simple. If you want to fucking run, then you fucking run. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it, sorry, it's pretty much that simple. It's pretty much that simple. You just run. And, 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 the, and the reason why I've won and, and the reason why I'm the only Democrat uh, elected uh, in my area is because I ran as myself. I'm unapologetically Afro-Latino. I am unapologetically uh, a kid from the hood. I'm all of these things, right? All of the isms that I have that I'm a part of, I am very proud of all of them. Yeah. And, and for the people that are outside and hear that, I hope that it inspires them to do the same. 
Yeah, and, I'm, and, I'm a no bullshit type of person. People know we, they see it. We hadn't we hadn't noticed that, John Carlo. <laughs> 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 well, it also it also sounds like you're both saying it's not an either or question. You right. don't hide your identity. You're proud of your identity, but. You said yourself, John Carlo, that you had two or three very specific things yes. like the youth center. So it's it's not a question of choosing between practical results and, and your and, identity. And Edward, if you could say this to Edward, I see that you say that you're openly gay. We got a whole panel of LGBTQ plus elected officials. You want to run for local office, brother, we'll help you. And we'll make sure you win. And don't feel like you have to be alone. So we've got uh, we've got several more questions in the chat, but I, but I see a hand up. So I'm going to go to Mary Ann, if you would ask your question. you're muted there's there you go um i'm not on my regular device which i still don't understand i for years have always had trouble with the partisan politics is it possible on the rural scale scale to run as an independent without having to do the democratic thing I I I often feel it's the lesser of two evils. I'm gonna be completely honest with you. If you're an independent that's like you know has a Black Lives Matter flag, they're gonna call you a communist. Uh, and if you're and and here's the thing about running as an independent, um, a lot of people think that like the Democratic Party is so toxic that like we can't run in rural communities. In many ways, unless we humanize the Democratic Party as being us unless we show people that, that, that we are your neighbor and that we are down the street and stuff and that we are, you know, normal and we live in your community. You see me at the ice cream shop or something. Um, we're never going to move forward. And the more we run away from being Democrats, the easier it is for Republicans to divide us. And guess what happens when we get that? We end up having unopposed elections. Um, and that's really one of the things that happens is we get people who want to run for office and we tell them, you know, you got to run on a major party ticket or else you're probably not going to win. And they tell me, no, it's OK. You know, I'll run as an independent. And guess what happens in towns that were won by Biden that the Democrats don't want to contest, but okay, independent contest, we end up losing. And we end up losing because there's no more major party line. And that's a big problem. And I, in terms of partisanship, listen, man, um, oh, I'm sorry, like I'm going to say it this much like. If people get mad at us for running for office and, and like if that's partisanship, then screw them. There's other people we can talk to and get them to vote for us. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go back to the chat box and this is a question from Farama. It says, we're in a rural community that's divided between those who grew up here and those who have re relocated here. You, I guess she's referring to both of you, I think. You seem to be native. And how do we break through as outsiders? And that I will add that in an awful lot of Appalachian counties, the, a big chunk of the Democrat, local Democrats are come tos, as we call them here, people who came from outside. So good question. What do you all think about that? Uh, John Carlo, you, you seem to like, get a lot of people like yeah. that in Gypsy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, definitely. Uh, I think it, it, it comes with, with intention, right? So if I... You know, I'm native to my area and somebody from, there's been a, an influx of people from Brooklyn moving up to Poughkeepsie, right? And so a guy from Brooklyn is knocking on my door that he, he wants to run. I'm going to ask, why do you want to run here? What is it about here that makes you want uh, to be an elected official, right? And so you ask that question to, to find out what's really going on. Um, you know, some of them will give you a bullshit answer. Oh, because, you know, I, I really care about the area and this and the third. That's a bullshit answer. Like, why do you want to run? I was like, you know what? Because I want to be here for a long time. It's because I've seen how great Poughkeepsie can be and I want to raise my child here, All right? So it really comes with intention. It's like, okay, you're an outsider. You're not really from here. You don't have generations of family here. But if your intention is for your family to stay here and for me to continue living the life that I've been comfortable living or even make it better, then, then I can get on board with that. Um, so it, it really goes with intention, with how you speak to people. And and again, I've said it before, people know bullshit when they hear it. Yeah. Uh, that's that's really simple like that. And so if someone comes knocking at your door, you've never seen them before, and they say they're going to run for office, okay, you're going to hear their spiel, and you're going to say, ah, fuck out of here. Right? 
until you get somebody else who who is not from the area and says, you know what, I'm running because I want to be here for a long time. I'm running because I want you to be here for a long time. Then you know what, what a person is all about. So it really is, it really, really depends on what their intention is and how they display that intention to you. Yeah. Oh, let me just add on one quick thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm a first generation immigrant, right? So my dad and me and my whole family, I'm first generation. So I haven't been in upstate New York for a while. What makes the connections genuine for me is that number one, I have a weird name, right? And so I have to teach people how to pronounce it. And in teaching them how to pronounce it, I have to make friends. Uh, and making those friends, I made the relationships in the community that I needed to. Um, and sure, did I get into a couple of fights in high school that someone called me a spick and then I, you know, may have, you know, gotten into fisty cuffs with them or something? Sure. Uh, but did I make great friends who may have voted for Trump but love me for who I am and whom I can sway on issues that matter for my community? Yes. And so nativeness does not come from the idea that there needs to be that divide. Like Giancarlo said, it's about wanting to stay in these communities. And it's also about showing that these communities are resilient. And that even though, you know, our small towns may be depopulating or something, that we're still here and we're still fighting. And, you know, I don't even live in rural America right now. I live in Brooklyn. But you know why the New York City liberals don't like me and so many people in upstate New York and across rural America like me? Because I make the people here understand that our communities are special. And I don't let the New York City Democratic elite erase people like me and John Carlo because we have as much a right to exist in rural America and so do you all. Thanks, I wanna go to Beth, but before that, uh, well, actually Beth, it was your question in the chat about deep canvassing. So I'll just open it up to you. I don't know if that's the question you wanna ask, but go ahead. You got it. I was wondering if you guys knew about deep canvassing. I've done a lot of training on that where you actually talk to folks uh, and understand their issues versus talking at folks, which I think too many people who run for office and who in politics do. Um, a lot of this has come out of a group called uh, People's Action, and I believe also um, CPD, I forgot what it stands for, Center for, uh, I forgot the word it stands for, but I was wondering what you guys thought about deep canvassing, and if, if, if you know what it is, if you don't, let me know and I'll give a quick little thing on it. Well, I would say I, I don't know what, what deep canvassing is. So can you give me a quick synopsis of what that is, Beth? Yeah, what you do basically is you go talk to people and you ask, what are the issues important to you? And you basically listen. So you listen to what they're mm -hmm. saying, a lot of what you're talking about, actually. So it's basically listening to what people, uh, where they're coming from, and you try and um, relate to them based on what their issues are. That's that's it sort of in a nutshell. Gotcha. So. Uh, I would say that I do deep canvassing, uh, not necessarily, well, in addition to knocking on doors, I, I also use my social media a lot. Uh, social media is a powerful tool for me, especially when I'm trying to reach younger voters between 18 and 30. If I'm trying to get those people, especially because they are the first times that they're coming in to vote, uh, that's what I say. I put on my social networks, uh, I'll say, oh, isn't, that a, isn't it a bitch that we don't have enough jobs here for kids 18 to 30, graduating college or graduating high school that they have to leave here, right? And then they'll say, yeah, hey, man, that, that, that pisses me off too. Uh, or a parent would say, hey, you know, my son or my daughter, you know, doesn't have anywhere to work. They have to live or, or work two hours away and I never get to see them. So uh, really using deep, deep my social media to reach the people that I, I couldn't normally reach simply just walking uh, or knocking on doors. So using my Facebook, using my Instagram, using my Snapchat, uh, going on Facebook Live and saying, hey, you know what, I'm just going to sit here and you're going to tell me what pisses you off today. And we're going to try to find a resolution for that. So I guess that would be my, my way of, of deep canvassing. Yeah. Oh, I mean, the only thing that I would add is because like our candidates are people who have had to kind of like get accepted in the community, that every conversation that we've had ever since like we like you know you were born in a small town or something as a person of color and moved to a small town as an immigrant has been deep canvassing because you have to listen to people's issues yeah. listen i'm sorry complain about like cuomo and shit that like doesn't matter uh and oh, not cuomo but like you know blaming pete blaming the governor uh, the current governor for like things that the county legislature controls uh and not them wanting to take a gas tax holiday and stuff and then you just talk about the things that matter and it works. Uh, but yeah, go ahead, Anthony. No, that's great. That's great. I want to go to Ellen. She has a question. Hi, it's um, a very uh, 
basic question. It's kind of asking for advice. Our local democratic committee, we're trying to recruit um, members for the school board to run for the school board on positions. The school board has become very politicized and um, has the, the usual critical race theory, don't teach your kids about sex stuff. Um, so the question is, um, how, how do you go about um, assuring a potential recruit that, you've, that we've got their back, that we'll be a good campaign team for them? You know, you were talking earlier, one of you, I'll forget which, about not needing a lot of money. Um, but what would you recommend um, we as a group say to a potential candidate, we can help you get elected and this is what we can offer you? Um, so Ellen, uh, and let me, I'll go first. First of all, uh, can I just ask you what county you're in? What state? Orange county, Virginia. Okay, cool. Uh, 70, 30 uh, Republican county. Uh, yeah, um, we'd love to come to Orange County and do an outrun presentation. Uh, they're free. Uh, we will build you a template. Uh, and really what we do is like we build like, they're not just like candidate recruitment like workshops. When you have a group of candidates like kind of demoralized, we show people that it can be done uh, with our candidates. And it's kind of like a pep rally. Okay. But that's, yeah, go ahead, uh, Arlo. Uh, I, I would say that, uh, so especially when you have, a, let's say you have a, a single mother, right? Who you think is a kick-ass candidate for school board and in the ways that you can support her. Uh, one of the ways that as, as the committee, you say, hey, you know what? I'll, I'll watch your kid for two hours and three hours. Oh, yeah. you know, do this thing, right? It, it's really about, if you really care about that that recruit and you really believe in that recruit, you're, you're going to make shit happen. It's, it's really that, that simple. Is that if they have a child, hey, you know what? I'll take your kid uh, for two hours while you go canvas. Uh, you know, go around it and, and knock on doors. I have no problem doing that. Uh, I would even encourage that if you are, if you have children, bring your kids with you. Yeah. Right? No, nothing is better than, you know, knocking on the door and they see a little kid and they're like, vote for my dad like, or vote for my mom. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, you know, when, when things like that, and that's just one example, right? So it, it really depends on, on the need of that potential candidate and what they need. Uh, for some of them may not have a car, right? They may not have transportation. And so I was like, hey, we can link you with somebody, right? Depending on, you know, what area you're going to, we can link you up with somebody who can drive with you. Mm -hmm. Primarily, you know, and primarily you want somebody who's from that area that they're going to canvas to. Mm -hmm. So bring that person around. So it really depends on, on the need of that potential candidate and what they need. And if we can supply it, great, we'll do that, right? Uh, if we can't, we'll say, well, we're, we're going to have to get a, a little bit creative here and, and see what ways we can do. Okay. All right, I'm gonna, I can send you my contact information and I'll just put, put it up on the screen. In the chat. Yeah, uh, if there's any way for us to connect with Ellen, we'd uh, set one up. Uh, we're booked through uh, October, uh, but uh, yeah, we can we can set up a rally. Um, can I just address- Orange, Orange County has also, I'll just mention, Orange County has been through the Rural Urban Divide training with Ruby and Ellen's been a regular on these briefings. So she's, she's definitely ahead of the curve, so. I, can I just address something here that I saw in the group chat? It doesn't bother me, but I am going to say something. Um, I saw that somebody had asked like what our funding was after they tried to say that we were like not like we're not actually fighting for rural representation. I'm going to tell you right now that we don't take any money. This is a part. To, this is a project that's free, and we donate our time to this. And if you really would like, make sure that like if if you really want to take advantage of this, please just instead of being skeptical, take what we're saying and think about it for a second. And then think about the community that you're running in and make sure that you actually can change the dynamic there. Because when we actually are able to use the skills that we throw, we show in our trainings, we've seen a 20% candidate recruitment increase. Um, and that 20% candidate re recruitment increase, over 90% of those candidates have won. Uh, so when we, when we actually increase the number of candidates that we recruit, and re we, uh, we recruit to run for local office in rural communities, you know, regardless of the whole yada, 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 you can't run this way, you can't run that way, or what's this outside organization coming in? We're not an outside organization, we're rural America. Giancarlo grew up in upstate New York. I grew up in upstate New York. We have over 150 panelists that are young people and LGBTQ plus folks and non-binary, lesbian and uh, black and BIPOC folks who won local elections across rural America, all while having shit thrown in our face by the local Democratic Party. So please respect our work. Thank you. Sorry about that. 
so I didn't take that as a skeptical question. I don't know what the intent was. I just took it as curiosity. And I'm surprised to hear that you do this all voluntarily. In fact, I'm blown away to hear that because <laughs> that's all the more ridiculous and impressive that you're doing all of this, you're expanding rapidly, and you yeah. don't have like a, a core funding base for core staff. I'm sort of shocked by that, but um, just, it, just it, that. it's really because we, we, we give a shit. Uh, like well, we, yeah, care, yeah. We, we care so much about, you know, having more people of color uh, of historically excluded communities in it because uh, myself, I, I was I was a state officer as well. Paulo was as well. And, and we saw the, the bullshit of it and yeah, saying, wow, you know, we need more people of color in here because there's too many white folks pretending that they know what uh, BIPOC people need. And yeah. so it, it's it's very important and for us. You know, the the satisfaction is when we have a candidate who who joins us on our call as a candidate and then eventually wins through the advice that, that we've given them, you know, over 60% of people who have joined these calls have won. Yeah, uh, really over 150, 60% of them have won as first time candidates. Uh, and so we, we, we've done, and, that, and that's the satisfaction of the British bills. Right? Yeah. Is that seeing that, wow, you know, we, we got somebody who uh, British is running. For example, no, one of our people who won money. Me. They didn't um, give me the option of getting Scottish. You can't. You can't. Uh, and there's, and there's, you don't. Edward, your your um, phone or what odd is on the is in trouble on the call. If you can mute, sure. that'd be great. Uh, for for example, one of the people who was part of Outrun, her name is Star Pool, is is a single mother with five children, who won as a first time candidate by herself. Yeah, who was also a victim of a house fire and had to resettle to Williamsport, New York. And at the same time that she won her school board election, who mind you, she was president of a local school board. But Williamsport also elected a black mayor. Um, and so I think. To be honest with you, and I saw somebody ask me if we're part of the DNC. Um, no. Here's our relationship with the DNC. We went to ask um, uh, the chair of the DNC, Jamie Harrison, if he would do something to talk address uh, racism within rural county Democratic parties, and we got crickets. Yeah. Uh, but this is what I want. This is the thing that I want to make a point out. As long as the National Democratic Party ignores these issues, the less the less we're going to be able to win in our communities. And the more that we as rural Democrats can bring this up to our state parties and to our national party and talk about these issues within internally to the Democratic Party, I, uh, I think it's the only way we can go forward. We only won our state Senate majority in New York State by making sure the New York State Democratic Party, by forcing, we almost, we almost vetoed funding to uh, parts of our state Democratic Party, me and John Carlin, and a bunch of other people. Uh, yeah. I, we refused to fundraise for the state Democratic Party unless they invested in districts that were in rural parts of upstate New York. And that's how we won our supermajority in our state Senate. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, I see Barbara has a question. Or, go ahead, John. Yeah, I was just going to comment. Um, I know Poughkeepsie long before you were born, even thought about, you know, and it's, it's changed a lot. I hope you'll eventually get jobs that are not service jobs, like the continuous line of malls that run through there. I live up in Ithaca, New York, where Cornell oh. University, Cornell University is. I'm Elmira. Yeah. Okay. All right. No thought. You're from the home of Mark Twain. So no wonder you have such forward thinking. Um, and, and anyway, Ithaca, you know, they consider themselves this bastion of progressivity, oh, yeah. but they refuse refuse to go in the rural areas. We're surrounded by rural community. I can't, I've learned to keep my mouth closed because I work on healthcare, but I cannot work with them because they don't want to go to the rural communities. And this is so frustrating for me. So right yeah. now I've rather given up on the healthcare movement. I will always advocate for single payer because there's no other way to go. It's an equitable way to do things. Yeah. But to work with people that only want to petition and, and table and go and lobby without bringing people into a conversation who you are going to pass a law for, no, this doesn't sit well with me. So the frustration, so I'm looking at media, I'm going for courses in media literacy. Barbara, if I could just tell you a story about why we found oh, it out. Please. I love stories. Tell a story. It's about New York 23rd, and it's about myself and a couple of other people in New York 23rd. It's about Tracy Metrano, if you remember oh, that. Oh, please. Oh, 
<laughs> yeah. Not so, a Tracy Matrano was a, a, a white college professor that ran for Congress in upstate New York. Um, yeah. Not knowing that I lived in the area in the Southern Tier, uh, and I tried to advise her on like steel workers issues and outsourcing and stuff like that. I think at one point told me that like, how can an immigrant like me know so much about rural communities when I'm an immigrant? And, and that quote that I brought up earlier about a candidate saying that Black Lives Matter needed to be unnecessary, that was her. And guess what? And, yeah, I'm, yeah, I yeah. could not, I had such conversations with her over the phone. I could not vote for her. I couldn't pull the lever yeah. to vote for her against Reed, who I can't stomach. Yeah. And she, was Barbara. the wrong person. Let me think of, let me tell you this, Barbara. Yeah. You know who yeah. the closest Democratic candidate was for our district? One of my heroes, one of my mentors, and you probably know him because he, and he moved out of the area recently, but the close, in a district that had a lot of South Pacific World War II veterans, the closest Democratic candidate to almost win that district was Japanese American county legislator from, from Ithaca, liberal Ithaca, Nate Shinagawa. And oh, Nate, Nate came, around. yes, and Nate stuff. came very close, yeah. but you know why he lost? The Democratic Party yeah. pulled Barbara. out Barbara. the money and I wouldn't support him. I want to talk to him. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> we, we're, we're past time. We're going to need to wrap up, and you guys are into some very, very specifics about <laughs> one, one place, so I, I'm going to wrap us up and just um, say two things. One is a huge thanks to Paolo and Giancarlo and to all the participants, great comments and great questions. And the second thing I wanna say is what, what uh, Paolo said a moment ago about when the, when the national party or the state party doesn't do it, we gotta do it. That's exactly Ruby's philosophy as well. We've been trying to put rural on the map, a slightly different emphasis, but in for very similar reasons. Um, and, and are having some success in doing that. So I think we, we all can um, look at that bottom-up approach and what we're trying to do because that's the way we get the folks at the top to pay attention. So thanks again so much to um, our presenters from OutRun, Paolo and Giancarlo, and y'all be looking forward to next briefing, October 5th, same time, and we're gonna have a panel of people talking about local community works, Democrats doing practical voluntary service works in their community as a way of solving problems and winning over their neighbors. It should be a very interesting panel. Hope to see many of you back then. Thank you all. Anthony, thank you so much. Another successful. This is so stimulating. Last, last month's and this month's so great to be here. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye for now.